All right, well, well welcome. Um, so we go ahead and get started today. We're going to talk about exercise and fitness. And um, there's a lot of different viewpoints on how to exercise, how to stay fit, how to live a long life, how to have, you know, maximize your vitality. So I'm going to give you um, my point of view and some of the latest research that I've been learning uh, in this area. And uh, many of you may have your own ideas or, more, or your own questions. So please feel free to, to chime in and, and ask questions. Um, we have a, you can go ahead and use the um, Q&A box there to go ahead and ask questions as they come up. Um, so um, without further ado, let me get ourselves started here. And I just want to frame the conversation a little bit. Um, and uh, the screen is black. Um, I'm wondering if other people have a black screen too. Can you not see me right now? If maybe people can comment if they can see me. Someone's telling me that they, you can see me. Okay, so that person's maybe having problems with their screen. Uh, thank you. So um, let me go ahead and uh, go ahead and share this presentation. And uh, if I can just get the right one up. Um, and I want to start with just a bit of, of, of a framing here um, and really just sort of talk about how we can think about exercise and how, how do we think about exercise. Um, and uh, hopefully you can see uh, the screen now uh, in my presentation mode, so in the full presentation mode. So um, when you think about exercise, it really it's important for us to consider the full range of exercise, which really is uh, thinking about how do you walk through your day day to day as well as intentional exercise. Um, and let me give you an example. And, and what I mean by that is that you maybe walk through your day and you say to yourself, okay, I haven't exercised, but, um, but I've walked a fair amount today. So, you know, I walk with my dog, I walk with my, uh, during a meeting, et cetera. And, you, it's important to consider that as part of your exercise. And the reason I'm framing this up front this way is because many of us don't exercise enough because we don't think we have time. And so we just don't exercise at all. It's sort of a zero one phenomena. There's no spectrum of gray here. And it's really important to think about to sort of redefine what exercise is. When you were a kid, exercise was, you know, go on the playground and you had PE. Um, and so that exercise was really filled with, you know, vigorous activity, right? Playing volleyball or football or, you know, tag or whatever we were doing on the playground. Um, some of you played, you know, sports, uh, formal sports, you know, in high school and or college. So, but as we get into our adult time, you know, we're not playing full contact football anymore, right? So we need to redefine um, what does it mean to exercise? And there's no question that being active through the day has health benefits. And there's also no, no question that intentional exercise has health benefits. And there's a lot of research now focused on the concept of um, both a sedentary lifestyle has its own risk factors, as well as exercise, meaning that you could exercise for an hour a day, but if you're spending most of your day seated, that's an independent risk factor for blood clots, heart disease, stroke, and other factors, because just think about this overall stasis, right? We're, we're much more sedentary than we used to be. Even those that are fit and exercising, we spend much every day in front of a computer. So it's important to think about that as we sort of talk through this. So I wanna start, frame that, and I'll, I'll come back to it later in the conversation. The other piece I wanna start, really talk about up front is being your best self. And, and what I mean by that is how, you know, imagine a time in your life where you really, uh, had things were in flow for you, things were seen almost effortless that the universe was providing um, and that things felt plentiful for you. And the reason I, I want you to reflect back on a time like that is to allow yourself to then reflect on what were the contextual components that allowed that to foster and flourish. And if you think about that, you know, there's moments in time where really things are just feeling like they're there's happening in a way that are effortless. And sometimes it relates to intention and sometimes it relates to really context. Um, and for example, um, if you're 
living your life in, let's say, your 20s and you're, you've chosen to live in a particular town that you, know, that you felt like you could flourish in, and then all these opportunities come to you, whether it's relationally with friends and our lovers or whether it's professionally or whether it's person, your own personal sort of transformation, whatever it is, you've set yourself up by being in a certain town or city or environment or with your friends to allow that to flourish. So reflect on that for a moment, because what I'm going to ask you to do at the end of this conversation today is to set yourself up so you can do that again in this time and age and where you are right now. So what were the conditions that contributed and what were you doing when you were at your best? You know, there may be different versions of that best. It may be a professional best, but it may also be a personal best. And thinking about those conditions and context to allow yourself to set up yourself for the next version of that, the next chapter of that for yourself right now. There'll be different conditions and there'll be, you know, different relations because you're in a different time and you can't repeat the past. But it's important to start to observe that and then start to notice what is the universe providing towards you. So, you know, holding on, on to that, that thinking being, you know, what small changes can you make in the way you work and how you engage with others and how you spend, choose to spend your time in your environment that will allow that new opportunity to come forth for you. You know, in COVID this past year, year and a half, um, there's been a lot of opportunity to do a reset, a bit of a regroup. We've slowed down a lot. We're now reopening. Today's the day of reopening in California, right? And so are we going to go from, are you going to go from zero to 60 and just sort of re fully re-engaged or are you going to allow yourself to sort of moderate your way towards reopening where you can observe what's happening while, while you're pushing down the accelerator? Uh, I encourage you obviously to do the latter because it allows you then to, as you're sort of pushing down the accelerator, start to notice what is it that actually is flourishing for me and gives me energy and what of it is actually draining and taking away my energy. If you simply hit the on off switch back on again, you're gonna miss all that and you'll find yourself in some of the suffering that you had before COVID came our way. So with all the suffering, you know, perhaps there's a moment here at the, at the global level, at the personal level to really find some silver lining in this. So many of you have probably heard me speak to the six pillars of healthy living. Um, these six pillars relate to what I call common sense, but not common practice. Uh, we're going to just be focused on one today, active living exercise. Um, but the other ones I list out here each have their own important sort of um, pedestal or foundational piece that allow you to thrive and flourish and age well. So um, let's talk about exercise. There's definitely different forms of exercise. I've definitely learned to reframe how I ask people about exercise when you sort of realize that this can happen. Um, and, and what's important to think about is if you think about a dog and how they exercise, you'll notice that there's a lot of them will sprint and then, and then slow down sprint and they basically sprint themselves to exhaustion and others do like the slow trot. And obviously in, the, in, in addition, in the course of a lifespan of a dog, you'll notice they may be used to sprint a lot and as they've gotten older, they know better and they simply trot a lot more, right? For longer periods of time. And that's the transition period that we wanna think about as we, as we move towards our, our aging process. Now we know that the cardiovascular risk reduction, so for heart attack and stroke, is dramatically reduced even with, with minimal low, phys low physical activity. So if you look at the red, the left side of this, um, as you move from left towards the right end of the half of the screen here from low to high physical activity status, and you look at the arc of that curve, the slope, you get, uh, there's a very steep slope with going from no exercise, sedentary lifestyle to some at a low physical activity level. You get that maximum benefit. As you move to sort of a high interval intensity training, HIIT, you know, HIIT training, which is really the green over there, you can see you get minimal additional benefit. You're getting benefit, but it's less profound than it, the original. And that goes back to my original point of doing something's way better than nothing. So um, I want to encourage that again. And you can see here, you know, can you make time for it, for it in your day? And really, the purpose is the intention is yes. So 
Um, just to spend a moment here thinking about that, you have sort of high intensity opportunities like this example of someone surfing here, um, you have low intensity opportunities. And I encourage you to do both. But if you, can, if you can't, don't have the inclination or opportunity to do the high intensity, you want to be doing the low intensity. What's the low intensity look like? So uh, maybe if you guys can call out some examples in the Q&A or the chat box of what's some examples of low intensity exercise. So walking being one, but please add more into the chat and, Q and or Q&A box so we can sort of share that amongst each other and have a conversation. We have a quiet group. All right. Yeah, great. So actually running up and down stairs can be even moderate intensity. Housework is definitely low intensity. Um, so, so doing yoga um, can definitely range, right? So that like you said, light yoga, absolutely. And there's vigorous yoga as well, where you're sweating and really picking up more intensity. Gardening is a great one. Yeah, biking at low speed is excellent. And swimming again, biking, swimming, these all have a full range, right? So for some people, a minimal amount of swimming is, is high intensity. Their heart rate goes way up. Um, for those that are relatively fit, they can take a nice slow pace swimming. Um, same with biking. So there's a, which is the nice thing is gives you really the full range. So when else mentioned Tai Chi, it's a great example of a low intensity exercise um, that you can actually really start sweating. And you, depending on the intensity of what you're doing, again, there's a full range there as well. Um, driving um, can be a psychologically intense exercise, but definitely won't be a physical exercise. Um, kayaking is again, full range, right? You can be sort of floating down the Truckee River um, or you can be in class four rapids. Um, walking stairs is a great one. Um, and for those that like to do race car driving, uh, which is uh, indeed, but that can be high intensity as well, um, depending on how high your heart rate is going and dance as well. So this is, these are great examples. What I love about these is there's for many of these, there's a full range. And the beautiful thing about that is it allows you to play with it. So you could say, I'm going to go for a 20 minute bike ride uh, at low intensity. I'm just going to go for a nice cruise um, and do it with my family. And, you know, I'm going to do it like, you know, my husband doesn't bike and I bike a lot. So I'm just going to go at a low speed with my husband because he's wants I want to do it with him and we'll do it at low speed. And then you can go and do some, some hills, you know, in addition to if you want to mix it up but it really allows you to give you the full range. The great thing about stuff that needs to get done, quote unquote, so housework, gardening, or stuff that you like to do, maybe some people like gardening. Again, that movement through the day is really important. Um, the other thing, again, I'll just bring it up for another time, is that we really want to be able to take breaks, not be seated for the duration of the day. So these are great examples. Uh, let's say going for a walk or a bike ride where you take a quick break in the middle of the day and go do that. Or even you know every hour or so between meetings or, or while you're seated doing whatever you're doing to get up and just walk about for even five minutes and then come back down. Um, so how long should we be exercising? So the national guidelines tell us that we uh, should be exercising for 150 to 180 minutes a week. Um, so what does that look like? So a lot of people for exercising 150, 180 minutes a week, they'll do it all on a weekend. So, you know, they'll go work out for 90 minutes on Saturday and 75 minutes on Sunday. Um, that doesn't work well for longevity because people tend to get injured, right? So um, weekend warrior as we move from our forties to our fifties and onward is a bad, bad plan. Definitely, I've seen many injuries as a result of that. Um, but for a lot of people, that's when they have a lot of time. So what I encourage people to do then is to spend the other Monday through Friday doing light intensity, but regular exercise. And that allows you to range your tendons and your ligaments through the, through the day, every day. And by doing that, you're actually lubricating, you're, you're allowing them to glide through within the fascia so you don't get the adhesions that you normally would get. Our, our, unfortunately, as we, you know, our general principle as we age is that there's sort of a, a declining slope, right? And our, uh, our fitness, our vigor, our, our elasticity. And so it's really important for us to be able to 
um, really allow us to say, um, it's interesting that you guys are saying you lost visual. So, um, I took away the slides and said that you should be able to see me, but are you saying that some of you can't see me? Is that correct? You can't see me? Okay. Some people can't see me, some people can. That's interesting. Um, so what I'll do then is I'll put up the deck again for those, because those, for some reason, some of you can't see me. Um, which is a little bit unclear. I'm turning off my video and turning it back on um, and see if that's helping. So uh, let me just share again. Never had this happen before. It's interesting. So um, what um, a little bit of exercise through the day is really important and, and a little bit of movement throughout the day. So a general regimen should be you wake up in the morning and you stretch. Why do you want to stretch? You need to range all the joints. By arranging the joints, you're doing two things, actually three. One is you, um, the joint itself um, has debris and other toxins and sort of waste products in it, and it doesn't have great uh, blood supply. So as a result of that, by arranging the joint, you end up squeezing and open the joint and allow things to flush through, out and in. Um, and also at the same time, joints, you have tendons attached to those joints um, where you have muscle fibers that then form a tendon that then attach to, you know, usually the other side of a joint, right? And so by doing that again, you're ranging that tendon and those muscles, which glide within a fascial sheath. And over time, those fascial sheaths and all these tendons and muscles and joints age and get debris in them. And, you know, the joints tend to get bony debris or bony growths in them. The tendons can have adhesions in them that attach to the fascia. The fascia themselves have adhesions. And so things get caught. So by ranging, you're allowing things to break up every day so that you, uh, it's like putting a penny in the bank every day rather than saving up, putting a dollar in once you know, a month. And by doing that, you allow things to stay uh, debris, debris free or reduce that debris accumulation. So that's one part of stretching. I typically recommend a, a simple yoga routine. It could be sun salutations with warrior one and two and some twisting, um, as well as some supported bridge poses. You know, there's a range of things you can do, but at a minimum, some sort of routine. I also recommend people use uh, uh, lacrosse balls because those, you, again, can get into areas that you can't normally reach and actually try and break up muscle uh, knots and fibers, the fibers that are sort of knotted, uh, and again, the fascia and what have you. And then third is, are these guns that are out now, these sort of, you know, hypervolt or thera guns, mobility guns that are like a drill that have a pumping thing on it, like a drill that, to, that does this motion with, a, with a, usually a ball or some, some object on the end that's relatively soft, again, to break up um, areas that have adhesions and tight tension. So that as a regular, on the regular for five, 10, 15 minutes every day really helps open up the body. It's like putting oil in the tin man. Then to do some movement. So even if the movement is, look, I don't have time to exercise, I'm gonna do it throughout the day, 15 minutes. So national recommendations are 150, 180 minutes weekly. Ideally people do five or, day, five or six days a week over distributed over the week, 30 minutes a day roughly. But even if you have 15 minutes, they've done clinical trials looking at that, you get two thirds of the benefit of doing 15 minutes as you do doing 45 minutes. So doing some is way better than nothing. Okay, so then we'll talk about the um, level of intensity next. So someone mentioned Tai Chi already. Uh, I wanted to speak to that as well. So um, the beautiful thing about Tai Chi is it's something you can do into your you know, um, 90s. You know, it's low impact, easy on the body. It does a lot of ranging of motion. So it opens the shoulders and opens the elbows and knees and hips, really does great range as well as the isometric action when you're, for example, standing in place or moving quite slowly um, that then builds that sustenance uh, and builds that strength. It helps with balance, um, works with breathing practices as well within it, works with mental focus. So it's really an, uh, like yoga, a mind-body practice. Uh, which I highly recommend. 
So um, now, what are some tips? So like I mentioned, 15 minutes of exercise every day at least, um, maybe keeping things visible, sort of, sort of you have to walk over your shoes, for example, if you're trying to, to learn how to, you know, remind yourself to walk more frequently or run or whatever it might be, putting clothing in your office or your home laid out. So it's laid out in advance. All these things are cues that allow, make it much easier for you to actually fulfill the, your goal, your desire, which is to move your body. Obviously accountability is an important piece. So a lot of times if you hook up with a friend that holds you accountable or a trainer that you're paying money to, that really can be helpful. Signing up for races or events are great too. Cause again, you know, gives you a milestone. There's a reward you can give yourself on the backside of that. Um, walking meetings, I really encourage people to do because that way you can weave it in your day. What I often will do myself and recommend, and you guys have seen it, those that are patients of mine, is I'll look at the, the data that I need in advance and then I, it's in my head and then we can just do a walking meeting. Or we'll sit down for five, 10, 15 minutes, look at the data and then whatever that might be, and then go for a walk or vice versa. I go for the walk and then sit down and finish it off. You know, let's, let's do, let's walk to the cafe and then we'll sit down there and pop open the laptop, right? So weaving that into your day, walking on breaks, parking further away and, you know, taking the stairs. So um, now I'm going to switch gears and, and really speak to what type of exercise should we be doing? So let me just first speaking about muscle fiber type and also about, about different types of fuels that the cells use in order to, to run. Um, Dr. San Milan is a PhD who's really done deep work in this, looking at the mitochondrial function, looking. And so what I'm gonna be doing in the next couple of slides is quoting him. He's given some great talks uh, uh, in general, some great writings. Um, there's a great interview with him by Peter Atia that's worth listening to if you know of him, A-T-T-I-A. Um, and so I'm quoting him from this interview, actually, where he talks about, you know, it's AT, about ATP generation, which is adenosine triphosphate. ATP is really the fuel uh, that we create within our body, within our mitochondria that we then use to burn um, as, as fuel for energy. It requires glucose or fatty acids. So that's the fuel source that allows us to generate through oxidative phosphorylation when you run down what's called the electron transport chain, you generate AMP to ADP to ATP, and then you use it. And, and so it's a, that he, what he says here is about ATP generation, that's exercise intensity. So at low exercise intensities, the slow twitch muscle fibers or type one muscles are very well designed to use an energy that is good enough to provide ATP, good enough underscore enough. And yet you can do this for a very long period of time. And that's the diesel gasoline. And that is the fatty acid. So the point being here, diesel, like a diesel engine, you know, you can't go zero to 60 fast the diesel, but that thing will go and go and go. Low torque or, or a low speed, I should say, it can just go and go. And that is where you use your fatty acids. They last a long time. Fatty acids come from fat. So you'll actually be burning fat from your body, adipose, which is what we want to do. Um, that'll increase insulin sensitivity, right? Because fat in our body stores insulin, creates insulin resistance, uh, and really increases the aging process in our body through every pathway you can think of, including cancer, heart disease, cardiovascular disease in general, autoimmune conditions, and, and just the function and vitality of our body overall through cellular aging. So we really want to um, reduce uh, um, insulin resistance or improve insulin sensitivity. And you do that by making yourself less fat. And you can do that by using fat as fuel. So the, hence the ketogenic diet and people doing intermittent fasting and people doing timed eating and the fasting mimicking diet, all these different diets that are out there that are designed to reduce your access to glucose, to, to carbohydrates, to so then convert to glucose reduce your access to that and force your body then to use ketones as the fuel source. So here, if you can use fatty acids as your fuel source, you do that by doing a low sustained exercise using which, which is engages the slow twitch muscles, which is type one. Um, if you crank it up and do high intensity, you're gonna actually flip over and use glucose. So as, as exercise intensity increases, then you need to produce more ATP at a higher rate. And in order to do that, you need glucose. That's the only way to get it. And so you rapidly will access 
your glucose in the bloodstream, then glucose in the liver where it's stored and, and to try and get access to it. And then you bonk, right? So then you can't get the glucose, you hit an anaerobic threshold, boom, you hit a wall, you fatigue up. Anyone's ever gone for long bike rides and they, um, and they just all of a sudden just hit a wall and or it, that's what we're talking about. So um, that's what, so we want to, you know, both avoid and also try and take advantage of. And what I mean by that is if we understand our physiology, we can say, we can retrain our sort of cultural habit to think that I, if I'm not exercising intensely, then I might, not, might as well not exercise at all. That's a fallacy, particularly as we age. So low intensity exercise, 15 minutes, three hours, long walks, long hikes, biking, all the things you guys listed, do that for long periods of time. It's an excellent way to get healthy. And you'll find yourself losing body fat, which is something we tend to gain over and over time and increasing muscle mass, which is again, something we tend to lose over and over time. Both of those directions, vectors is where you wanna go. Um, more muscle mass, less body fat. Using fat, uh, fatty acids as your fuel source by doing low sustained activity. What do we what what do we mean by that? So uh, there's different training zones that we that, that we can do this in. He um, provides here. Some people have five training zones. Some people have six. Some people talk about seven training zones. So it's a little confusing. Um, if you look at trainingpeaks.com, which is this gentleman's um, website, he sort of defines what we're talking about here. And you can see here the zone one and two is accessing fat and carbohydrates and type one fibers, the slow twitch ones. And then you can see as you move up zones three and upward, you get more and more, you're taxing carbohydrates as your, as your predominant fuel source. Um, so you wanna really get into that zone two, zone three, you know, like Orange Theory, I think uses a seven zone training program. So I, that would be more like zone three in their nomenclature. And this gentleman's nomenclature is more like zone two. And that's really a, a heart rate that's actually a little bit less than you normally think. So your, the goal is for most people, a heart rate of 120 to 140, depending on your age and, and fitness level, where you're actually breaking a sweat, but you can still speak a few sentences at a time. So you can't have full conversations, like paragraphs at a time speaking for five minutes, but you can speak a few sentences at a time. That's the level of intensity that you're looking for, where you're breaking a sweat, but you're not completely exhausted. That's the low zone two. Um, so I, um, I'd like to pause for a moment and then you know, sort of address any additional questions that people wanna um, have related to this. So some people have asked about whether or not we can um, really um, do high intensity exercise and what's the, what's the downside of higher intensity interval training. Um, so high intensity interval training is actually excellent um, depending on how you do it. So some, some folks will do basically a sustained sort of diesel rate as we talked about, you're in zone two and then boom, you go up to zone five and then you're back down to zone two you're back up to zone five. And that, if for those that are extremely fit, that's a great way to do it. Um, most people get prone to injury because as you transition from low intensity to high, or even if you just do only high intensity and then sort of end it, um, people have that have issues going to that level of intensity with respect, not putting aside the fact that people get exhausted, but people then tend to strain their tendons. Um, and and or they fatigue themselves so quickly that they then injure the, their joints or their ligaments holding their joints. So as we get older, I only recommend people do high intensity interval training if you have a baseline already of fitness that will allow you then to upregulate. Um, and I also highly encourage people to do it extremely slow and, and really modulate a version of high to a modified version. It's because uh, I've seen too many people 
have Achilles tendon ruptures, for example, where they all of a sudden they had to snap um, it, because their body's not used to engaging that quickly, or they get knee injuries um, because they find themselves, they, they fatigue out, and then they have an underlying uh, historical injury or just weakness that they didn't really know about. And then all of a sudden they get unstable and, and have an injury. Um, all right, some other questions here. Um, Great, so one question is, um, uh, uh, two different great questions here uh, and a third here. So one is, is the idea of anaerobic, what's, is this the idea of anaerobic versus aerobic? Um, it is, although actually he argues that it's not, but I think for our purposes, because he's, he's, this gentleman's extremely you know, engaged in the research. Um, that is, when we hit our anaerobic threshold, uh, for, for most of us, actually, that is true that we sort of bonk out um, and then we try to use um, lactic acid. But what it turns out is actually certain high performing athletes can actually use lactic acid as a fuel source. And so if you're, if you're interested in this, this, his interview is really great with Peter Atia, and he speaks to these guys that are high elite athletes. They have a unique physiology that's able to use lactic acid as a fuel source. Most of us can't do that. Um, so for that reason, he starts you know, this notion of anaerobic and aerobic, he says it's not completely valid, but yes, the, for the vast majority of us mere human mortals, um, that's right. So we'll, we'll go ahead and do, uh, anaer if you hit the anaerobic threshold, then you'll, uh, when you hit that anaerobic threshold, that's when you're accessing, um, or trying, or trying to access glucose, and then you hit that threshold and you can't, and then you get that buildup of, of lactic acid. Well, there, as you, some of you may know, we do VO2 testing here. And what, when you do that, what you see is people's heart rates dramatically increase as they hit their anaerobic threshold. Their heart rates dramatically go up and yet their output stays the same or starts declining. And that's you know when you're bonking, if you will, if you're a cyclist, um, that's when you know there, there, there's extra effort being put in and yet there's no output that's, that's, that's actually materializing from it. And that's when you, you you know, hit that wall. Um, next question is how much high intensity workouts versus low intensity workouts do you recommend per week? So people should exercise daily. So my recommendation is we should be doing low intensity exercises every day. And that could just simply be walking, right? Like all the things we listed before. Um, how, then the question is, well, how long? Most of us don't have the time. Ideally, people are doing two, three hours of low intensity exercise, you know, throughout the day. Meaning I do a little housework and I'm doing a little gardening and I'm going for a little bit of a walk and I'm just sort of, there's a bit of that moving throughout the day. It's almost like you're noshing for food, you know, nibbling all day long, but it said it's the nibbling is your low, ten, low intensity exercise. Many of us don't have that lifestyle or that time. Um, so I recommend people at least do 15 minutes on the ideally, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you have the time and you're interested in fitness, then um, I would say 15 minutes of low intensity on your high intensity days. And then um, on the intensity only days, ideally 45 minutes to an hour. And then on the high intensity days, you're doing 15 minutes of low intensity, plus you're doing anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes of high intensity exercise. For those that don't have that much uh, don't have the ability or desire to exercise with such intensity, then I, I again, I go back to you're way, out, way better off just doing low intensity exercise. Do it on the, on the regular, do it for 15 minutes, and you're su substantially in a better position um, from a cardiovascular risk and aging than, uh, than not doing anything at all. Um, another question is um, related to, is our goal to get to high intensity interval training or can we maintain health and vitality by walking Pilates, et cetera, for exercise without doing high intensity interval training? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the goal isn't to do high intensity interval training for everybody. Um, the, the, there is some science that looks at high intensity interval training actually improving our mitochondria function. Um, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And so that level of, of what we call hormesis or stress on the body forces us to then um, sort of realign our, our mitochondria so that the ones that aren't functioning as well get tossed out. We may even create new mitochondria 
which we used to think we couldn't do before, but it looks like we can. Um, so there is a bit of a, this purging and, and uh, re sort of constitution process that happens. But similarly, and you asked this question related, that the same person asked this quest, question related to intermittent fasting. What we know also about intermittent fasting is that you, um, that also creates some hormesis, a bit of stress on the body. And that can be helpful too. So what does that mean? And that's, since we're asked, we discussed intermittent fasting a little bit today and the question has been asked, let me just talk about what, I, what we mean by that because there's many definitions. So intermittent fasting can simply mean um, I'm going to fast two days a week, like the 5-2 diet. Some of you have heard of out of the UK. So two days a week I'm fasting or I'm eating you know, 500 calories. The other days I'm eating regularly. Uh, some people mean it to mean um, I'm going to not eat for 12 to 14 hours over the course of the day. I call that timed eating because it's really meaning when are you going to eat? So I, I'm going to eat over an eight or 10 hour period of the day. And the reason that that uh, puts a bit of stress on the body is because the uh, typically it's, you know, in the evening hours, right? So call it 8 PM to 10 AM, something like that. Um, and then the intentionality around that is that your glucose stores are getting depleted. And so you're starting to learn to access ketones as your fuel source. Again, that puts our body into a bit of hormesis. What else does another example, for example, is cold water. So if some of you've heard of Wim Hof um, and cold plunging. So going into starting off with a cold shower, maybe 15 seconds, then going up to 30. And so you take your shower at the end of your shower, you do 15, 30, 45 seconds up to a minute, then you go up to two minutes of a cold shower. Um, and then as if you feel more comfortable with that, you can transition to a bath and actually bring a cold bath, maybe even put ice in the bath and you build a tolerance to that over time. Again, that's creating hormesis, a stress on the body. That's not one that's gonna make you sick or injure you, but one that's for the moment startling. Um, you get a lot of vasoconstriction and, and a lot of vaso actually dilation in the periphery as your body learn accommodates to that. And that vasoregulation, again, like I was saying about ranging the joints, it does the same thing by purging, opening and purging the system to clean the system out and puts a, a charge on the system that creates hermesis, which then leads to this mitochondria upregulation and better functionality of our cells so that they can access fuel better, right? So we're, how do we get our brains to function better? You know, our memories, how do we keep our memory clear, our ability to stay focused clear, our concentration good? How do we keep our, our body agile and not in injury? These are the ways to do that. So breathing practices, cold plunges, and this type of low intensity exercise. Some people can layer in the high intensity, um, but you, it's, it's not required. All right, let's see if there's any other questions. Any other questions that come up? I think I've answered most of the ones you guys have posted. So um, if there are more come up, feel free. So the, um, here, does, does 10,000 steps, uh, walking have any relevance or is this less okay? Yeah, absolutely. So 10,000 steps is the walking I was talking about, the low intensity walking, right? Low intensity exercise. To do 10,000 steps is roughly five miles and that takes people 45, 50 minutes. It's not, uh, you know, we, we've, we've sort of said, oh, 10,000 steps as if it's nothing. It's actually a, a reasonable commitment. Um, and I like it because people can look at it through the course of their day having to have my steps in. And that does count as low intensity. It doesn't low intensity exercise and it doesn't have to be all be in one moment. So you can do it throughout the day. There was a great clinical trial where they randomized a group of folks that were 70 and older to 45 minutes of consistent exercise contiguously or three um, intervals of 15 minutes each throughout the day. And it showed it was equal outcomes, whether you did three uh, in intervals of 15 minutes each or 45 minutes consecutively all at once. So again, getting your 10,000 steps is awesome. Uh, can you lose weight with 30 minutes a day of exercise or is that just exercise? Yeah, you can definitely lose weight through movement. Um, by exercising, you get an increase in your met metabolic rate for the moment and you, you get a burn and then actually you get a sustained increase in metabolic rate throughout the course of the day. So, um, you know, 30 minutes of walking at low intensity is not a lot of calories, but it's way better than none. 
Um, okay, so moving on a bit, I wanted to just transition here with our remaining few minutes to talk about um, how do you make the changes that you want to make in your life? I mean, we can talk about all this, but th then we lose sight of, well, that was great. So like my New Year's resolution and I'm back to square one on January 5th. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things I just want, want you to know through the science of behavior change that are really important. But one is do something that you're excited about. That's the vertical axis here. If you're not excited and you feel like, okay, I have to do this, you know, part of you is saying, you got to do this, you're a horrible person, you keep saying you're going to do it, you're not going to do it, you know, that that is not going to motivate you. You want to do something that you're generally excited about. Um, so that may be walking, it may be kayaking, whatever it might be. Um, let's pretend it's kayaking. Then the other question is sort of the horizontal axis. How easy is it for you to be able to do that, right? So if you live in the Mission District and you want to kayak on, on the regular, that's going to be more challenging, right? If you live out, you know, near the bay um, or in Marin County near, near the bay where you can access a, a lagoon, obviously it's much easier. Um, if you have to buy a kayak and your wife's going to divorce you over it, makes it more difficult, right? So but these two are the most critical factors to keep in mind. What's the, how motivated, how generally enthusiastic you are and how easy it is, for you are, um, it is for you to be able to do that activity. When I run workshops with people, what I have them do is take this and you can do this at home on a big like poster board. And then I take, have people take post-its, you know, like this and then spend two minutes writing all the things they wanna do. So let's say they wanna exercise more. So then I write, have them write down, let's say they narrow it down to, I wanna exercise more. Then I will ask you to do is take a post-it and just write very specific things that you need to do to get there. So what is what kind of exercise do you wanna do? So you may say kayaking, running, you know, et cetera. And then once you hone into, let's say it's running, then what do you need to do to make that happen? It may be I need to buy a pair of shoes. It may need I be I need to calendar it. I need to have my executive assistant, you know, carve out part of the day for me. Um, and there's a range of things that may be required. I need to get permission from my partner, et cetera, et cetera. I need to start stretching. I need to drop, you know, weight before I can do it to fix my knee, whatever it might be. And then you post that, you lay that across this two by two axis. And you'll see that certain things are a lot easier for you to do than others. And certain things you're more excited about doing than others. And the one that lands on the upper right-hand corner, the easiest to do and the most motivation is the one you do first. And then um, the, this uh, BJ Fogg, this beha Fogg behavior model, what he talks about is if you want to learn to floss your teeth, you floss one tooth. You commit to flossing one tooth at a time. And then you put your floss next to something you do on the regular. I brush my teeth every day. Great. Put your floss next to your toothbrush. So if you want to, let's say you end up with running, buying running shoes on the upper right-hand corner, then you put, you know, somehow you put that on your to-do list. And then once you accomplish that, then you, next thing you want to do is buy, take those tennis shoes and put them so they block the front door, right? So you have to bend over and grab them and move them in order to get out the door. Those are called cues. So there's a range of ways to actually improve the likelihood of your success. Um, step number one is this two by two. Step number two is to really hone it down to the smallest little task possible so that you're, it sets you up for success. Step number three is to have people be accountable uh, to you or you're accountable to them, I should say, whether it's a personal trainer or a friend, um, set, set up a goal for yourself. And that's really the, the, will allow you to be most successful. For some people, they're trying to break a habit and others are typically beginning a, a new routine. And so again, um, here's sort of on the right-hand side, we sort of talked about all these different, uh, these different pieces. So uh, the, what I encourage those to, that for, you, for those of you that are motivated, what I encourage you to do um, tonight is to do this. Take a piece of paper, jot down different ideas that you have about what you want to do. And talk to your spouse, your friend, someone who can hold you accountable and make a commitment to something that you actually do want to do. And, and then you can then within, you know, the intention would be after a week for you to then connect and, with that person who can hold you accountable to that. Um, so we're, we have a few more minutes left and I want to spend, if anyone has any further questions to really uh, feel free to put them now, sort of we, have, we can sort of address some of these questions before we conclude tonight.
So while I'm waiting to see if anyone else um, has any other thoughts or questions, just a take home message here is to, to think about fatty acids and glucose. So when you're exercising and you're beating yourself up because you're not exercising hard enough, just remind yourself, fatty acids, fatty acids, go easy on yourself, fatty acids. You wanna burn the fatty acids, meaning you're gonna burn the fat off your belly, right? That's a good thing. So remind yourself not to beat yourself up and do it on the regular. If you do it twice a week, it's not going to do much for you walking 15 minutes twice a week. It's better than nothing, but doing 15 minutes on the regular is where, is where you want to go and weave it into your day. Make excuses. You know, you're going to go talk, you need to sit down and talk to someone, take them outside for a walk. Um, and then, okay, so one more question here. Can the stretching be done at any time of the day? So I typically, I'll tell you my personal routine. I'm someone that has suffered from um, chronic pain um, from back issues since I was in my 20s. And so I developed a routine because I had no choice um, of twice a day. So I do it upon wakening and upon going to bed. Um, I, sometimes it's five minutes and sometimes it's 35 minutes, depending on how my body's feeling. So I wake up and I just gently move the body. Uh, I, I typically roll out a yoga mat and do yoga, but everyone's a little different, but I gently do that. To, it's like oil in the, in the tin man. And then I go through my day. And what's so shocking about that is that I didn't know, you know, my right, you know, upper trap, it was tight until I actually stretched it. And I'm stretching, I'm like, oh my God, I even noticed my neck. I must have slept funny last night. Um, and so the beautiful thing about that is then you don't end up with all of a sudden a neck spasm. You're like, where did it come from? Because you, ha you had the awareness two days prior and that morning, you're like, oh, there's some tightness here. And at the end of the day, it really dramatically improves your sleep if you stretch out the body because it allows your mind to quiet, but most importantly, we hold a lot of tension in our, mu in our body. The muscles get tight and tense. And by stretching, you can release all that and your sleep will be profoundly better. Um, and I mean, as a quick anecdote, uh, I can remember when I used to work long hours and I would get up early and, you know, work sleeping five, six hours or so. And uh, my wife would just laugh at me because it'd be 1.30 in the morning and I'd have to get up at six and I'm spending 25 minutes doing yoga. She's like, you have five hours of sleep and you're spending 30 minutes of those five hours doing yoga. But there was no question that the quality of my sleep was better. And now that we have wearables, I actually could document that. It's shocking. Um, so sleep efficiency is dramatically improved. Um, okay, a couple other quick questions. Um, light exercise, thoughts on light exercise during an intermittent fast? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, you need to modulate. And let me just tell you about folks, you know, those that like to fast. Depending on how, how sort of what your general behavior is and how, you know, exercise and your diet, et cetera, some people feel quite ill in the first few days of their fasting. And it's because there's a lot of detoxifying that's happening out of the joints, out of the fat, that where things are being purged. And so people can feel fluish, you know, with achy, swollen joints, et cetera. And that's normal and it will pass. Um, so depending on sort of how you are during your fast, you can do light exercise. Some people do tolerate it well. And some people, if they're already feeling fluish, won't tolerate it well. So it's really, um, individualized, but many people that are used to doing the intermittent fasting, it depends on sort of what you mean by intermittent fasting, but let's presume it means a 14 hour fast, you can do light exercise. If you mean on the 5-2 diet, like two days you're doing the 500 calories, then you can uh, get your body gets used to it and you can introduce it. If you mean like a prolon or the sort of fasting mimicking diet, which is a five day fast, um, typically people can do the first couple of days and uh, towards the back half, they tend to have a harder time or some people it's the opposite where they're feeling fluish the first few days and they really don't move much. And then towards the back end, they're feeling better and can do light exercise. Um, yes, this is being recorded and you love for your husband to see it. So we'll post this on my YouTube channel. It's Dr. Brad Jacobs' YouTube channel. Um, so feel free to sort of find that channel. It'll be posted there. Um, and the final question, would using a fascia a roller accomplish the same thing as stretching? Uh, they're different, um, but rollers are definitely helpful. And if you have trouble stretching, uh, rollers is a great way to start. 
And again, I recommend using a lacrosse ball as well, but uh, rollers are great. Um, and they're a great way to sort of really move, spread the muscles, get the, move the fascia a bit. Um, but it doesn't quite get the, the tendon. So where, you know, the tricep, for example, comes and anchors down here and you're doing the, the roller along here, you can get the tendon, but you can, if you're, if you're too, if you're not subtle with it, you can actually injure yourself on the, with that roller trying to get the tendon insertion. But doing the stretching itself really will stretch that tendon. So ideally there's some combination of both. Um, well, great, thank everyone for your, thank you all for your time. Um, sorry for some of the visual disturbances. We'll try to figure out what happened there. And we'll, we do this once a month. Um, probably in the early fall, we'll start doing this in person again, as well as uh, on the webinar format for those that want to come in person. Um, so we'll look forward to that as well. I wish everyone well and be safe out there as we reopen. And remember, please try and regulate yourself as you reopen your life again. And so you can notice what's happening as that happens, as, as that unfolds. All right, take good care. Bye-bye.